By the late 1890s, the gold mines of Cripple Creek were literally extracting money from the earth. The millionaire gold mine owners were building enormous mansions, living like royalty, and becoming some of the most lavish citizens in the world, except for the richest of all. My fellow citizens, my name is Winfield Scott Stratton. Winfield Scott Stratton was born into a world that bored him, and yet kept him constantly occupied. The sixth child of Mary and Myron Stratton was born on July 22, 1848, in Jeffersonville, Indiana, and named after the symbol of American westward expansionism at the time, General Winfield Scott. He grew up among much unrest, both nationally and at home. His mother died when he was 17 years old. Winfield Scott Stratton witnessed the Civil War as a teenager along the Ohio River and was bombarded with the ever-constant rumors of gold in Colorado and California. At about 10, 12 years of age, the strike in the uh, Pikes Peak region had happened. He heard a lot of rumors about the gold in the West, and one of his interests was to eventually head West and do prospecting. The family shipbuilding business gave Winfield Scott Stratton an apprenticeship, and he learned the art of carpentry alongside his father. Winfield was an excellent carpenter, but he resented criticism from anybody, which often led to extreme outbursts of anger. The arguments with his father only escalated as time went on, until one of the most heated fights led to Winfield Scott sending a bullet over Myron's head. Winfield Scott Stratton had finally chosen to leave Jeffersonville for good. Winfield Scott Stratton dreamed of the mountains of Colorado, and he made it his quest to reach them. He left to become a carpenter in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1869. Dreaming of the future, Stratton saved every spare cent from his carpentry business in Lincoln to ultimately move to the mining fields of Colorado. I arrived here one year after General William Jackson Palmer had started the Fountain Colony. He had driven a stake into the ground at the corner of Pikes Peak and Cascade on July 31st, 1871, and started the Fountain Colony. He set up a carpentry shop with his $300 on the corner of Pikes Peak and Nevada Avenues in September of 1872. I was an anonymous character. I had no money, but I was a good carpenter. The city was new, and it was being built. So as a result, I was able to get work right away. I lived in a boarding house. And the pattern of my life was to work as a carpenter through the winter months from approximately mid-September into mid-April. He built many houses in Colorado Springs, including the famous W.S. Jackson and Helen Hunt Jackson home at the corner of Kiowa and Weber Streets. By 1873, he had become a popular member of Colorado Springs society. But his ultimate dreams of the riches hidden in the Rocky Mountains would outweigh the comfort of Winfield Scott Stratton's life as a carpenter. Motivated by rumors of silver in the San Juan Valley, Winfield Scott Stratton sold his carpenter shop in the spring of 1874 in order to buy a $3,000 interest in the Ritaba Silver Lode. It turned out to be a bust. While the mine itself turns out to be worthless, the claim itself is worthless, Stratton becomes very interested in the idea of prospecting. He renews his original dream when he was little of going west and prospecting. Broke and without work, he decided to continue to search for gold and silver in the Colorado mountains. Stratton quickly made his way to the Leadville Silver Rush in 1878. Stratton saw many poor men just like him become instantly rich in Leadville, but he never made a single cent there. I was but one of thousands of men at that time who were called prospectors. I wandered from Aspen to Breckenridge to Leadville, down the Arkansas River, over into the San Juan Mountains, into the Gunnison Valley, searching for that elusive silver or gold. He does keep current with what's going on in the mining field and is uh, more than willing to try new methods. 
He took courses in metallurgy at the Colorado School of Mines and in mineralogy at Colorado College. He kept busy prospecting for gold and silver in various places. And he worked for a while at the Nashold Reduction Mill in Breckenridge. By 1890, though, he was fed up with gold and silver and started searching for cryolite, a rare mineral used in steel production. The pursuit of cryolite led him to Cripple Creek in the spring of 1891. Stratton stayed up late in the night on July 3rd, thinking deeply about the geology of Pikes Peak he had learned at Colorado College. He fell asleep and had a dream. In the dream, he saw a mine on the south side of Battle Mountain. And on the morning of July 4th, 1891, I rolled the dice and I staked two claims on the south side of Battle Mountain. One I named the Washington Mine, the other the Independence. My life was changed. On the Washington claim, Stratton struck a vein of gold, which yielded $25,000. With some money in his pocket, he then set his eyes on the Independence claim. Stratton dug into a small vein on the Independence in 1892, but quickly lost it. Digging everywhere on the claim, he finally dug a chute into the extremely rich main gold vein of the Independence. He hired a mining crew and quickly developed the Independence claim into a fully working mine. It made Winfield Scott Stratton the first Cripple Creek millionaire. Knowing that Cripple Creek was extremely abundant in gold, Winfield Scott Stratton built up a mining empire in the area. One of the things that seems to be a theme is a lot of these mines at this time are in trouble. So what Stratton does is he ends up lending them money or buying up the stock and gaining control of the mining properties that way. By 1895, Stratton was earning over $165,000 a month and only because he meticulously limited the amount of gold extracted from his mines, still planning for the future. He only spent the money he felt he needed to spend. Although Stratton could have easily built an extravagant mansion with exquisite furnishings, he bought a fairly modest frame house on North Weather Street, which he had built earlier as a carpenter. Stratton was known for having a pretty violent temper uh, and was also very demanding. It was not uncommon for him to have his workers uh, in, in the process of building a house to rip things out if it wasn't done correctly. So he was a very demanding um, employer. In an ironic way, I took on the burden of wealth. That may seem paradoxical, and yet that was my experience of it. Within six months, I began making some money. Within a year, I was doing well. Within two years, I had more money than I had ever dreamed I would make. And I saw those towns of Victor, Cripple Creek, Anaconda, Goldfield, Gillette, boom into the greatest gold camp in the world at that time, greater even than the Transvaal in South Africa. On April 20th, 1899, Stratton sold the Independence Mine to the Venture Corporation for a sum of $10 million. I regretted not selling the independence mine for $100,000 when I had the opportunity. Instead, I held on to it and eventually in 1899 sold it to the Venture Corporation for 10 million. I would have been better off selling it for 100,000. I've said, no man needs more money than $100,000. Stratton became increasingly dependent on alcohol and his health was slowly failing. It may have seemed that the millionaire was on his last legs, but Winfield Scott Stratton's greatest legacy was yet to begin. Although Winfield Scott Stratton's luck was not always good to him, Colorado Springs always was. Amidst failure after failure, Colorado Springs was Stratton's sanctuary from the mountains. It was civilization on the still untamed western frontier. And most importantly, it provided Stratton with a livelihood before he found gold. He never forgot that. I came back to Colorado Springs and lived here, and I was convinced that the wealth that I had gained was not a personal gift to me, but rather should go back into the community. And I followed that principle the rest of my life. And I began giving my money away. First came Stratton's employees. Stratton offered his workers 30% higher wages than the average paid at other mines before the strike of 1894. 
Then came the needy families of Cripple Creek and Victor, to whom he gave free coal. He also bought bicycles for every laundry woman in Colorado Springs. Slowly, people started lining up outside Stratton's house asking for money. Many were quacks and prostitutes, but many were in actual need of financial aid. Stratton could easily pick out the needy ones as they were noticeably reluctant to ask for money. They received checks, not uncommonly, higher than $10,000. A young boy named Louis Persinger came to my office. He was 10 years old. And he asked if he could come over to my house and play the violin. So I invited him, and so he and his mother came, and his mother explained that if he had good classical training, he could become a fine violinist. I wrote her a check on the spot. He didn't have to write an application. I didn't interview him. I didn't check his family or anything else. I just wrote the check. He and his mother went to Leipzig, Germany. He continued to write to me, and each time I wrote him, I put a check in so that he and his mother could meet their expenses. He graduated from the Leipzig Conservatory, became the assistant conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, came back to this country, was the assistant conductor of the San Francisco Symphony, and then spent a career at the Juilliard School teaching in New York. Um, it, I, if, if someone said, what were my standards? I didn't have any in terms of who I, I just gave it to him and let it go. When people did not come to Stratton's house, he would sometimes nonchalantly stroll around town, giving people noticeably down on their luck a few thousand dollars to clean themselves up and get back on their feet. Winfield Scott Stratton's generosity also addressed the city of Colorado Springs. He bought a prime lot at the corner of Nevada and Kiowa Avenues and gave it to the city on the condition that it spend over $100,000 on building a new city hall on the site. The city hall building constructed on the site still stands 100 years later, serving both as a working city hall building and a symbol of the strength and pride of the citizens of Colorado Springs. Stratton's donations to the community also extended to aiding in the building of a county courthouse, a post office, and a mining exchange building, which all still stand today. I suspect that it would surprise many people today if we said, well, would you give money to help build a government building, the post office or the city hall? I don't know whether many people would do that today. Stratton, a believer in public transportation, also bought and funded the old Colorado Springs streetcar system, which lasted until 1932 and was the predecessor to the current transit system. These important city improvements created the infrastructure necessary to lay the groundwork for a happy and prosperous Colorado Springs. In his time, Stratton donated $85,000 to the Salvation Army, $25,000 to the Colorado School of Mines, $70,000 to Colorado College, and made countless other generous donations to charitable and educational organizations. On September 14, 1902, Winfield Scott Stratton succumbed to his failing health and alcohol. But death did not stop his generosity. Stratton's will left sizable amounts of money to the Deaf and Blind School and Colorado College. But six million dollars were set aside to build an institution dedicated to the upbringing of underprivileged children and the care for elderly living in Colorado Springs. He stipulated in his will, after making certain provisions for immediate family, that he wanted the bulk of his estate to go to the creation of a free home for poor people who basically were without means of support and who were unable to earn a livelihood due to old age, youth, sickness, or other infirmity. Stratton did not dream of this institution becoming a poor farm typical of the time, but a dignified and caring home. It addressed the needs of children uh, who were orphaned uh, or whose parents were unable to care for them and it provided housing, medical care, clothing, food, uh, and an education. Um, on the other side of the campus, uh, the home also provided services for the elderly. And there again, it provided housing, medical care, nursing care, uh, food, and so on. It took, unfortunately, a period of seven years after his death to meet all of the legal challenges which then allowed the original trustees to go ahead and create 
the Myron Stratton home. So the home was incorporated in 1909 and it opened in 1913. Finally, Winfield Scott Stratton's dream came true as the first residents of the Myron Stratton home moved in in 1913. Stratton decreed that the home was to be named after his father as a final resolution to their long-standing arguments and an act of ultimate respect. It was a self-contained community. Uh, it had its own power plant. Uh, it had its own farm and ranch. Uh, and it was basically an island onto itself. The Myron Stratton home still exists today, continuing to fulfill Winfield Scott Stratton's dream. It was part luck that Winfield Scott Stratton became a multimillionaire. Luck made an excellent decision, though, in choosing Stratton. His legacy can still be seen today throughout Colorado Springs. His gifts to the city helped the then small town build necessary infrastructure, allowing it to better focus on improving the lives of its citizens. Winfield Scott Stratton also personally improved the lives of less fortunate people. Today, the Myron Stratton home continues to provide services to young people and dignified, beautiful living quarters for the elderly. Stratton believed that it was his duty to improve his community with the vast quantities of money that he did not need. Winfield Scott Stratton's generosity greatly contributed to making Colorado Springs the thriving community it is today. Let us continue to cherish his memory and dreams.